For 75 years, AAGB has been working in these islands. Right from the start, they have been committed to supporting people in every walk of life, in every environment, in every place, because the disease of alcoholism knows no frontiers, it knows no boundaries, and over those 75 years, it has demonstrated time and time again that wherever it's needed, it will go. Following that first meeting between Bill W. and Dr. Bob in 1935, awareness of the Alcoholics Anonymous program grew swiftly in the USA, with press coverage that soon reached Britain and Ireland. By 1946, the General Service Office of AA in New York was receiving inquiries from alcoholics in Great Britain, prompting American member Grace Ursler, a survivor of the Roaring Twenties, to get in touch with them during a trip to London. Canadian Bob recalled that first meeting in the Dorchester Hotel. It was Grace O who really triggered off the inception of AA in England. Eight of us met in her hotel room. Meeting in different venues, the group was eventually established in January 1949 as the first London group. It met regularly and carried the message of AA across the country, placing ads in national and local newspapers. In November 1948, England's first regional meeting, the Bolton Group, was founded in Manchester City Centre. In August the same year, Sir Philip Dundas, a military officer, started a regular meeting in Perth, soon followed by Glasgow and Edinburgh. People in AA who got into the fellowship in this country had to form links with America to get guidance as to how to develop the, the organisation. Just to illustrate what a great leveller AA is, we overheard an anecdote and it was involving... Um, uh, some apologies for two people not being able to get to a meeting and one of them was a rat catcher and the other person was a baronet from Scotland. And the rat catcher was from London. Yes. And yes. this was at a meeting in the 1950s. It's cunning and baffling because that's what it was for me. I always thought that I was giving up something and um, what I didn't realise was I wasn't really giving up anything, I was gaining so much more. In 1948, Bill H offered his office in the London Fruit Exchange as a service office and, with his brother, set up the first AA telephone helpline. The office was sparsely manned. Ironing board Arthur is reported to have had to close it to attend to 12-step calls as they came in. But with the new central service office at 11 Redcliffe Gardens in 1952, calls could be taken throughout the day. This is Flaxman 9669. My name is Henry, I'm an alcoholic. How may I help? Nowadays, it is easy to forget what a lifesaver this was. I was 24 years old. It was 2003 and I'd hit my rock bottom. I rang AA and for the first time ever, spoke with someone who understood me, didn't judge, didn't want to know my history, didn't tell me off. I regularly volunteer for the phone service. And when I hear an alcoholic who doesn't know about how to stop drinking, doesn't know where to turn, doesn't know what to do, let them know they're not alone. Let them know that I was there once. You can hear the joy even if you can't see it on the phone. You hear their voice go calmer. In 1950, Bill and Lois W. visited England, Scotland and Ireland. They came in about 1950. He donated the royalty rights of the sales of the big book in this country to the development of an organisation for Alcoholics Anonymous. 
the initial gift was the impetus to develop some sort of financial backing to the embryonic formation of an AA organisation in the UK. And having taken advice from Rockefeller to say that you have to be a self-funding organisation, I think that the gratitude um, and the generosity is perfectly understandable so that the uh, organisation could become independent. Our founders, Bill, Bill W and Dr Bob, I would have loved to have met them two men. They're just absolutely fantastic. You know, if it wasn't for those two men, thousands of people wouldn't be alive today. How incredible is that, that they've changed so many lives? In 1951, the first Welsh AA group started on Cathedral Road, Cardiff. Meanwhile, the first issue of Roundabout was published in Scotland. Scotland has got so many remote areas right up in the north. It really was a leveller. Everyone was able to contribute. If people couldn't get to a meeting in the Northern Isles or in Highland, then they could get a Roundabout magazine. It's a meeting between meetings. In 1956, the first national convention was held at the Bellevue Hotel Cheltenham. It was mostly service meetings with some fellowship sharing. A first Scottish national convention was then held at Allan Water Hotel, Stirlingshire. It seems to me that what has been arranged for this convention is that certain resolutions were to be discussed today and voting was to take place tomorrow. Other resolutions have been put forward only this afternoon. By 1957, 60 groups registered in England and Wales and the inaugural meeting of the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous, GB and Ireland Limited, was held. It was the first board formed outside North America. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of AA in England and Wales, when I joined the board, they sent me on a trustee training. And I think that is a, a fantastic thing because it means that the organisation has got good governance, you know, and no one's going to run away with the money. People listen to each other. It's a very cohesive unit. Whenever I was asked to do service, I'd take that position. Um, that's what I live for, to be honest. So, doing service for other people helping other people. It's a gift which has been given to me. So if people ask me for help, I try and help them. I try and help them because I want to help them. 1972 marked the 25th anniversary of AA in Great Britain. A celebratory convention was held at the Bloomsbury Centre in London. Share, a meeting between meetings, was first published and in the same year, AAGB undertook the first survey of its members. It was quite obvious that the organisation was growing in this country, but what we needed to know is actually what was it like as an experience for people attending. We started to show the importance of attending AA regularly the importance of getting a sponsor. This still holds true, although recent surveys show that there are many changes in how suffering alcoholics first hear the message. I'm looking at the 2015 survey. Prior to that, people would make contact with the AA through another AA member or um, through the medical profession. But the big striking change was the uh, making contact with AA through the, the internet. But also there was a lot of younger people coming through at the beginning of uh, the things sort of less than the age of 40. I was 23 when I came into AA. I was very, very unwell. Um, luckily for me, my mum saw it in me and she called AA for me. I was very young, yes, I felt as though I didn't fit in at first. I thought, I can't be an alcoholic at 23. You know, I was just drinking like everybody else. I don't understand why I'm here. 
but I think um, the bit in the big book that was read out, the it's a disease, not a moral issue, and I fit in and I related to these people and I realised this is what I need, this is where I felt like I'd come home. The success of intergroups in the 1970s meant that they could come together to form regions and be more effective. By the beginning of the 1980s, the whole of the UK became regionalised. So we had 14 regions at that point. People were able to deal with things on a more local level, um, hospitals, prisons, locally, but then come together and share experience with each other. So really communication between the areas from Scotland right the way down to um, the south of England and everything in between. The Irish service structure formally established their own board of trustees in 1977. Further afield, English-speaking meetings have been taking place on the continent of Europe since 1948. The first European meetings were started by servicemen from the States and Canada who were based in Europe following the Second World War. And they felt the need to come together, to unify really and be able to communicate. We had expats in Spain, in Italy, across Europe, but they wanted to belong to an intergroup. And so, uh, yes, it was an exciting time. In 1981, AAGB Conference invited the English-speaking Continental Europe region to join its service structure as Region 15. As many European countries had developed their own structures, the first European service meeting was also held in 1981 in Frankfurt. There were 14 countries attending and they each had two delegates. But it, everything was just so great about this because people were determined to be part of this, to come together, to share experience, strength and hope. 2015, it came to York and it has really taken off from there. It is so meaningful. And I'm, I'm, I'm honoured and privileged to have worked in amongst these wonderful people. In 1991, AAGB started working formally with subcommittees to help the still suffering alcoholic. One of these included prisons. Prison AA meetings had already been taking place in HMP Wakefield since 1958 and in HMP Barlinny, Scotland, since 1960. I came to work with AA for over 22 years in my day job with the Scottish Prison Service, where I worked with uh, members of the fellowship coming in to prisons across Scotland to offer help and support for those in our care who were still suffering alcoholics. I would have been quite skeptical. AA proved me wrong and I'm so happy. I was in prison. I was coming towards the end of a very long prison sentence. I see this group of lady come inside. They go into the chapel, they give a biscuit and teas. So I went. And I went uh, there, and it was the first time my life changed in prison. Just by me, stopped drinking and it improved so much. It was 21 November 96. After several years which I was outside, I decided okay, for me to give it back by doing some service in the prisons. So for me, it was the best things I could do to take the message inside. Uh, and uh, sometimes it be sad, sometimes it be a reward so much. I see people going through and getting sober, come out clean and carry on to do well, the, the programs. Another valuable service discipline is Armed Services Liaison. I've had this for 24 years to celebrate my first year of being sober in recovery. I got it the purest gold that I could get because that's, that's like my abstinence, my sobriety. 
it's got to be 100%. I spent 31 years in, in the RAF. I gravitated towards people who drank the same as me. It was a while after, after I got sober, I started to think about the, the other people in the services that I knew were having problems with alcohol. And, uh, and I thought, what could I do? Outreach, basically what it means is that I send letters, emails, uh, go and visit army bases, air force bases. I've found that when I tell somebody that I'm ex-forces myself, that's a way in and I can then talk to them. It's absolutely brilliant. One of my 12-step work was a young woman from a Sikh family, and I got very close to her and her family, and her mother would only let her go out to meetings if this young woman was with me. So we're now talking over 30 years ago. So even at that time, you know, there were a lot of cultural barriers. And so as a result of that, I feel really passionate that, you know, uh, especially women actually in this country. I mean, there are women getting sober in this country, Indian women, and, and not just Indian, you know, uh, people from other ethnic groups. The message of AA is that AA is inclusive. It is absolutely um, designed for everybody. As the membership evolved, meetings opened up for women, younger people, LGBTQIA plus groups and Polish, Spanish, Punjabi and Urdu communities. The Development Fund of AAGB supports the Sub-Saharan Service Meeting and helps countries with translations of the big book. I think literature is key and not just uh, literature in the English language, but I think literature goes a long way towards getting people uh, acquainted with the idea of AA and what AA stands for. It has evolved. It is much more wide-reaching and much more inspirational and much more um, inclusive than it ever was. To celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of AA in GB, a national golden convention was held in Blackpool. A further London celebration was held in the synagogue on Cumberland Place, W1. In 1998, Conference asked GSB to set up a website. By the end of the year, it was live and has continued to evolve to better carry the message. We decided that Alcoholics and Anonymous should be anonymous but not invisible. And so we decided to be more proactive. Lots of things have been added to it along the way, like the Where to Find, where people can, you know, just log on and find a group near them. The Chat Now launched in October 2016, and it's a live chat for anybody that's got a problem. They can talk to somebody real time. Hundreds and hundreds of people have actually used the Chat Now system and it really does seem to, to work. In 2007, a diamond edition of Share was published to celebrate AAGB's 60th year. And GSO moved from Stonebow House to the current home at 10 Toft Green in York. When we were in Stonebow House many years ago, some guys came along and bought a, a huge amount of literature, lots of leaflets, lots of bits and pieces. And they packed it all up nicely in a box and uh, then went off to the car park and decided to have a little walk around York. There must have been sidetracked somehow because the box was left in the car park and somebody called the police and the bomb squad came and blew it, <laughs> blew it sky high. Literature everywhere, all over the car park. Spreading the message, <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. A conference 2015 decision brought the young person's liaison officer role into the service structure. When I started going to intergroup as GSR, a service position at intergroup level came up, which was young person's liaison officer. You know, Manchester's got a really vibrant student scene. Uh, there's lots of young people, so they research things a lot online before they go into it. So I built a website, Younger People in Manchester AA. And on that site, it, it basically tells the experience of what it's like to be young. Lots of FAQs, am I too young to be an alcoholic? 
So what I try to do with my service position is to tell that story and to put people's mind at ease about the things that they're worried about because we've all worried about those things as a young person who, who wants to stop drinking but worrying what that will mean for their social life and, and their life in general. The pandemic hit and meetings had to close. The AA Fellowship responded and within days, groups were meeting online. We had probably four or 5,000 meetings that needed to have the addition of the online platform put on with the login details and everything. So there were three or four of us that spent the whole of last summer changing the website and so that people could, you know, sort of make contact because of course there was no physical meetings and it was a big job for everybody. All the meetings shut down uh, very, very quickly um, and it was pretty much overnight and I got involved straight away onto online meetings and it would have been the worst time for anybody who is really struggling, um, being stuck at home, not being able to do anything, not being able to meet people, where we were able to interact with other fellows and try and, and create a virtual um, way of actually doing recovery and creating service that we usually do at a live meeting. One of the things that strikes you very quickly is how committed people are to service, how committed people are to being there for others. They just go and do their bit to help other still suffering alcoholics. AAGB now has groups that meet in person, online and hybrid. Adapting to changing times, our principles remain the same. I am responsible. When anyone, anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA always to be there. And for that, I am responsible. So for me, the promises have really come true in my life. I am only halfway through and I've amazing wealth of friends that I can call on any time, day or night. I can't thank AA and, and its members enough. AA saved my life, without a doubt but then went on to give me a better life, a happier life. When I see somebody come out of prison sober and stay sober, it's like a walk in the air. I am the happiest man, you know, that I know my job is done. The biggest thing I'm grateful for is to have my emotions back. I can't thank you enough for being free. Thank you, AA, for giving me my life back. Thank you, AA, for making me part of my family, you know, and my community. But above all, thank you, AA, for making me into a decent human being. I would say that's what AA has given me. It's given me my spiritual being. <laughs>